Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Her Excellency Mrs. Fatma Jalal, Ambassador of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Her Excellency Mrs. Farrell Ismail Ashraf, High Commissioner of the Socialist Democratic Republic of Sri Lanka. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural event by the Muslim Expats Network entitled Islam and Global Citizenship, a lecture by Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. I'm Ali Abdullah and I will be your MC for today. Before we commence further, let us begin this blessed afternoon with the recitation of the opening chapter of the Quran, Al Fatiha. A gentle reminder to all, please note that no recording is allowed and kindly set your headphones to silent mode. Alright, the Muslim Expatriate Network, or MEX, in short, was formed in 2012 as an outcome of the Third National Convention of Singapore Muslim Professionals in June 2012. This convention that occurs once a decade is a review of the social, economic, political and religious developments within the Muslim community in Singapore. Without further ado, let us now welcome Mr. Azman Ahmad, Chairman of the AMP Group to deliver the opening address. Mr. Azman, please. Her Excellency, Mrs. Fadiel Ismail Ashraf, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Nine months ago, the Association of Muslim Professionals embarked on a two year planning process aimed at identifying strategies to propel Muslim community in Singapore forward and catalyze its progress. The combination of the planning exercise was the third National Convention of Singapore Muslim Professionals held on 30th June last year. One of the key strategies that was proposed and endorsed was the formation of Muslim expatriate networks, or in short, we call it Max. Max was proposed on the basis that the inflow of foreign talent into Singapore is inevitable. As such, it is felt that the Muslim community should leverage on the increasing pool of talent, especially those who are Muslims, as a new engine of growth. In forging this strategy, it is important for us to build bridges for Muslim expatriates in the local Muslim community so that there is no gulf between the two groups. MAX therefore provides a platform to bring together the Muslim residents and expatriate communities with the local community. With this in mind, AMP hopes that a common space is created where new residents and expatriates are able to better appreciate the local Muslim community and vice versa, leading to a strengthened social fabric. The aim is to grow this common space through time and eventually build a larger and stronger Muslim community in Singapore and finally the society. There is much to benefit from each other and I am heartened to note that we now have a sizable number of Muslim expatriates, residents and new citizens who are part of our network. Some of them are here with us today, taking time off from their very busy schedules, and I hope they will join and encourage more of their like-minded friends, families and associates to join the MEX network in future so we can work towards our shared goal. After several months of hard work, I must say really hard work, yeah? no work to get Max starting, I am proud to welcome you here today to the inaugural Max event. 
We are very fortunate and blessed indeed with Imam Faisal. Thank you very much for your attendance, Imam. Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, an esteemed figure both in the Muslim world and the West. Imam Faisal will be speaking on global citizenship and Islam, which is certainly apt given next aim, as well as as well as its multifaceted composition. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today in commemorating what is a historic master for us in AMP and Max. I do hope you enjoy yourselves and benefit from the session today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Azwood. I know my is Dr. Muhammad Nawab Usman, Vice President of MEX, for his welcoming address. Dr. Nawab, please. Uh, Excellency Mr. Sariel Ismail Ashraf, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The formation of the Muslim Expatriate Network was a result of a long thought process by a group of local and expatriate Muslim professionals. The idea was the brainchild of Mr. Yang Razali Kasim, unfortunately he's not here with us, one of the founding members of the Association of Muslim Professionals. The process started in 2010, culminated, which culminated in the official launching of MAX in June 2012. In my mind, the formation of MAX is a long overdue process. This initiative involves Muslims in Singapore extending their hands to welcome fellow Muslims who have decided to make Singapore their home. While individuals might have done this on the choir, this is the first time such an effort is being formally undertaken by an organization. Such initiatives were historically very common. In the past, important port cities from crucial knots that were essential in linking Muslim traders the world over. It was a common practice for Muslim traders to contact individuals upon entering a port of lodging for lodging, food, and business assistance. These individual, individuals were part of the famed Muslim trade network. In essence, with the formation of MEX, we seek to revive this tradition once again. We envision MAX to be the modern day norm for Muslim individuals who are looking to make Singapore their home. The one-stop one portal that MAX has recently set up would give us, give us a glimpse of Muslim life in Singapore. Akin to the trader network mentioned earlier, MAX seeks to assist new immigrants to get a better feel of the Singaporean Muslim community and the larger Singaporean society. MAX seeks to form a collaboration between the local Muslim community, residents and expatriates so as to effectively tap on their talents. Muslim collaboration were historically once again common amongst traders who arrive in Singapore from different parts of the world. Their joint effort has contributed greatly to the, to the development of Singapore as an important global city today. Today, Singapore is still attracting people, some of whom are Muslims, from all around the world. We believe that there are certain areas such as banking and finance where the local Muslim community is less represented and can, can thus tap on the expertise and networks of the Muslim residents and expatriates. MAX will thus serve as an important platform to build bridges between the local Muslims and new Muslim residents and expatriates. The board members of MAX thought that the best way to start this process is to fo focus on the thread that binds us all together, the belief in the Islamic faith. We are truly fortunate in this endeavor to have with us a man that truly embodies the spirit of love and unity, Imam Faisal Abdul Rahul. The topic of discussion on Islam and global citizenship is certainly relevant to a globalized Muslim populace having constantly deal to having to constantly deal with the demands of global rapid globalization. We hope that this talk will signify a new phase in the development of Max and that all of you will join us in this effort. Thank you. May I now invite Mr. Sharik Bamaki, a key member of the MEX network, to share his insights about his experience in MEX. Mr. Sharik, please. Uh, 
I'm standing between you and, and the lecture by Imam Faisal, so I'll keep it pretty short. Um, Her Excellency, Mrs. Ferial Ismail Ashraf, High Commissioner of the Socialist Democratic Republic of Sri Lanka, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As was mentioned, I am Sharik Barnaki, and I'm a Muslim expatriate living in Singapore. I became a Singaporean 10 years ago, and it gives me a lot of pleasure to stand before you today to share an insight into MEX and to tell you why you should extend a hand in partnership with us in making it a resounding success. As both Azmoon and Nawab have mentioned, MEX started off as an idea mooted by a few of us local and expat professionals in consultation with the expat professionals of diverse nationalities and cultural backgrounds. As is the case with any breakthrough idea, MEX initially received its fair share of skepticism on the basis that the different Muslim expat communities in Singapore, by and large, exist in enclaves without much social and business interaction with the local community. Clearly, we felt there was a gap that had to be filled. And the idea of setting up MEX was logical, sensible, and the need of the hour perhaps. As we knew, that it would yield real benefits for the Muslim expat community at large, as well as the local community. It was with this passion for community service that we officially presented MEX as the key strategy for the success and development of the Muslims living in Singapore at the convention that has been mentioned a number of times of the Singapore Muslim professionals in June 2012. The guest of honor then, Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Sien Lung, welcomed the MEX acknowledging the prospect that MEX will take a place in the evolving geo-economic and social cultural landscape in Singapore and the region. It was also at this the same convention that the MEX quarter, and again those of you who came in uh, earlier would have seen some uh, snapshot, snapshots of that, that MEX portal was unveiled to the public for the very first time. The MEX portal, which is nexsg.sg, is a portal for the Muslim expat community, which seeks to provide information essential to Muslim expatriates who have recently arrived or wish to come to Singapore in the future. It is a platform for social interaction amongst Muslim expats of different communities, cohesion between local and Muslim expats, as well as a means of communicating fresh, exciting, and intellectually engaging events, such as this one, for all Muslim expats and beyond. MEX has also, in the short duration, made thriving partnerships with numerous expat organizations in Singapore. The idea being to outreach to their respective communities as well as with local organizations. We are very proud to have as our partners the Singapore Pakistani Association, the Turkish Cultural Center, the Indonesian Muslim Association of Singapore, the Singapore Bangladeshi Society, the Arab Network, SNSO, and others including some embassies, consulates, and high commissions in Singapore. It is our dream that MEX will get the support of everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims, expats and locals in materializing a robust network which will drive cultural exchange, social engagement, community su support, and business development, both at the organization, at organization and individual levels. On a more philosophical note, Life is nothing without meaning, and what better way to enrich and bring meaning into our lives by building bridges between us. Bridges that intertwine into a rich tapestry of culture, successful cross-border and local businesses, and dynamic and rigorous exchange of refreshing ideas and opinions by intellectual discourse. Let us capitalize on our strengths and best practices to bring value to one another. Max's objective is to embrace our diverse backgrounds, cultures, ideologies, and business interests in forming a network of support that will bring all of us success and co communal joy. That is my key message. Many thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sharik. Okay, here is the moment that we've all been waiting for. It is my honor to invite Imam Faisal Abdurraouf, accompanied by our chairperson, Mr. Shamriya Sam Ahmed, to the stage now.
You want to find out, please? Salams and peace and blessings to all of you in this room. Um, we had a private event yesterday and I was asked to introduce Imam Faisal. And this uh, morning, Nawab asked me to introduce Imam Faisal exactly in the same manner as yesterday, last night. So for those of you who attended last night's event, forgive me for being redundant. I'll add a personal touch to how I met this wonderful man. The year was 1999, and the place was New Jersey, specifically Princeton University. My sister was getting married to David Georges in, um, in the chapel of the Princeton University. And that was predominantly a Christian wedding, which was followed by a Muslim wedding um, in, in, in the weeks to come. But it was quite interesting because we moved from the chapel to the private um, dining area. And predominantly the whole crowd that attended was Methodist Christian. Now, the, the, the minister, I said the priest last night, I, I, I recall the priest is actually for Catholics. I didn't know that. But the minister um, got up and gave a sermon and to a, to a crowd that was largely Anglo-Saxon white Christians who were drinking, you know, wine at the table. And followed by that, they introduced Imam Faisal, who came up to the podium. And the first thing he said was, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the most glorious, the most magnificent. And you could tell um, the reaction of the predominant audience there, you know, this was 1999, way before 9-11, way before most Americans actually did research on what Islam is and what a Muslim was, and way before Imam Faisal really became as famous as he is now. So they were questioning who is this man and you could tell from the body language and the energy in the room, you know, it wasn't overwhelmingly positive, which is expected. Anyways, that was the first time I heard him speak, and I was uncomfortable myself, but when he spoke, he didn't speak about, um, you know, he didn't f speak about forcefully exporting Islam or trying to manipulate or convince the audience otherwise, he spoke of common values, values which resonate with everyone, of integrity, of dignity, kindness, wisdom, knowledge, compassion. And you could tell the audience during that 15 minutes was largely opening up. And at the end of it, people actually clapped and the minister got up and embraced him. And you could tell that you know, he broke and he, he actually, there was a shift in paradigm and people's perceptions that day changed. It was a small effort in the grand scheme of things, but it was a landmark in my eyes to, 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 to see a man who could change the perception of a few hundred people. The thing is, Imam Faisal is not only the ideal ambassador for Islam and for Muslims, but he's also a role model, the ideal role model for, for Muslims like us, or for any Muslim. Because the perception of a Muslim is, is, is from Western, Western eyes, is those that you know react, those that sometimes use violence and 
those that sometimes actually are irrational. You know, let's, let's not fool ourselves. That is the perception in, in a lot of non-Muslim sides. But when you can speak with, with dignity, with knowledge, with integrity, with compassion, when you can resonate, when you can connect, that, that will be the biggest assets to any Muslim community around the world if we can have people like Imam Faisal. So that's something from, you know, from a personal perception perspective that I wanted to share with you. Let me just introduce him formally as well. So, okay. Ready? okay, well, let me introduce Imam Faisal, and um, he'll be, as you know, uh, talking for the next 15 minutes, and we'll open up to Q&A uh, after that for the next 45 minutes. Please welcome Imam Faisal. It's hard for me to get people to speak about me. Um, and now that half an hour of my lecture has gone, so I can I have to limit my remarks. It's wonderful to be here. Congratulations on MEX. When I first saw Max, I thought of Mexico. It was in America. We think of Max as Tex Max. You know, we think of it as uh, like Tex Max restaurants are like uh, Mexican food, Mexican restaurants. So uh, it's nice to see that MEX is associated with Islam for a change. Um, it's wonderful for me to be here. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, it really is my pleasure to be here. Uh, on my way is uh, Firdaus, the gentleman who accompanied me, was asked me, this is your first time in Singapore? I said, no, my first time in Singapore was in February of 1955. He almost fell out of the car when I said that. <laughs> uh, and when I heard uh, blank on names, please forgive me, said you've become a Singaporean a few years ago. I was rolling up in my mind that, you know, when I was here, there was no such thing as a, as a Singaporean national identity at that time. Uh, I have been studying the issue of identity uh, in part because I myself have had to go through uh, very deep challenges to, to my own identity. Uh, I grew up at a time, uh, you know, in the early 50s, mid 50s, 60s, when um, uh, this kind of multiple identities, like many of you have, was not really extant. Um, I mean, I see Naz married to a Greek American, and her children proudly identify as Bangladeshi, as I understand. Uh, but, but you know, when I, I see increasing numbers of people today who are genetically multicultural, genetically multi-ethnic, genetically multi-religious in their own in their own parentage. And uh, a few months ago at American University, there was a young man who said, I have 28 different nationalities in me. He is American Indian, Chinese, Black, Scottish, and went through a whole list of, uh, of different things. So the issue of identity is becoming increasingly uh, a, a, an issue. Uh, but one of the myths that many of us have is that our, our identities are static. The reality is that our identities have always been evolving. Um, 60 years ago, there's no Singaporean national identity. 200 years ago, there's no Malaysian or Indonesian national identity. People were from Palembang, from Aceh, from Java, from, from Malacca, from Pahang. They didn't think of themselves as Malaysians. There was no such thing as an, an Indonesian identity. It was created after the Dutch-British boundary, this created the Malaysian and Indonesian identity. And in fact, Sukarno created a national language, uh, you know, the Bahasa Indonesia, to unify uh, Indonesia and to help create an Indonesian national identity. A hundred years ago, there's no Saudi national identity. You're either a Jersey, you're a Najli, or different Emirates. Like today you have in the, in the Emirates, you're either, you know, from Dubai or from Abu Dhabi or from whatever. Uh, these regions had different kind of local identities. So identities have been shifting a lot in the last century. And with the increasing globalization that we have been undergoing in the last uh, couple of decades, in fact, the, the term globalization didn't even exist 20 years ago. I, uh, I remember um, going to a conference in Portugal on, uh, on globalization. This is when globalization was a new buzzword and there was an Italian gentleman from the Vatican. And I began my remarks by saying, Julius Caesar <coughs> never had spaghetti with marinara sauce 
followed by a cup of espresso. Why? Because until Marco Polo went to China in the 1300s or 14th century and came back to Italy, the Italians didn't know pasta, they didn't have noodles. Marco Polo invented noodles after seeing noodles in China and coming back. Before the discovery of the Americas, the world didn't know tomatoes. Tomatoes was one of the products which came, and even chilies, chili peppers, were one of the things which came from the discovery of the Americas. So a marinara sauce made with tomato sauce did not have, the Italians didn't have this. And before the Ottomans introduced coffee to Europe, Europeans didn't know coffee. But today, you go to Italy, have a meal of you know, spaghetti with marinara sauce, followed by a cup of coffee, and you actually believe you're having an authentic Italian meal. <laughs> now, this is one small illustration of how globalization manifests itself. And you see this in foods, and even in Malaysia and China and Singapore, you have these fusion cuisines of, uh, you know, the, the Chinese nonya cooking or the Pranakan cooking in, in, in uh, you know, in, um, in Penang, and uh, Mimamak, which is the Indian meat. I mean, there's no in Mimamak in India. If you go there and look for Mimamak, you'll not find it. Um, I, when I was uh, studying to get a teaching license, my, my education professor was talking to me about this new entity in, in, uh, which she never heard of before. It's now a member of the United Nations called Sri Lanka. I said, you mean Sri Lanka? The old Ceylon? So today we have a new name. New identities are being forged. And I think as time goes on, the reality of the human condition, which is what this subject is about, is overtaking even our national identities. So many of you here as expatriates in, in, in Singapore. You may, many of you may not be here five years. You may be in Dubai, you may be in Shanghai, you may be in other parts of the world. And if you don't have an identity crisis, your children are likely to have one. But this then also underlines the, 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 the search for, for redefining who we are as people and who we are as, as, as a nation and who we are as various communities within other sub-communities. Muslim expatriates of Singapore, the Muslim expatriates of, of, of anywhere in the world. Uh, but these identities are different identities that we all operate within. But when you say you're a Muslim, you are redefining yourself in a particular way. But I, I, I fear the, the fact that we have fallen a bit too much in love with this Muslim identity. So much that we've had even in the last century, the beginning of a new phenomenon of people trying to establish Muslim states, Islamic states. We fall in love with the idea of Islamic state, Islamic banking, Islamic dress, Islamic whatever. Um, this application of the term Islamic as an adjective did not exist until about a century ago. The Muslim philosophers, Muslim doctors of law of a thousand years ago, they, didn't talk about, they talked about the, 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 the just state, they talked about the obligations of the ruler to the ruled in accordance with the principles of the Quran and the jurisprudence of the law that came. They didn't think of it as in terms of what Islamic. They thought in terms of justice. They talk, talked about the obligations that we have to other faith communities. What has happened is that when we have fallen in love with the word Islam, Islamic, we have created a kind of an idolatry of Islam. A friend of mine who's now retired, he was the Chief Justice, Qadi Quda, as they call him, in, in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, once said to me, oh, gosh, I don't like this term, Islamic banking. Because when, when, when then a bank fails, they say the such and such Islamic bank has failed. People think Islam then has failed. Why do they call it interest-free banking? Because that's really what it is. So when you try to shoehorn, you know, the whole religion, Islam, into a particular 
narrow definition of a state or of a bank or of a dress code or whatever, you're actually trying to say too many. You are trying to, you, you are narrowing down. And you, are, you have made a noun of Islam that is not really a noun. When Islam comes to the hadith of Jibreel, the famous hadith when the archangel Gabriel came to visit the Prophet when he was sitting with his companions, and asked him, what is Islam? The Prophet, you know, most of you know this hadith, the Prophet said, Islam is that you bear witness that there is no God but God, that Muhammad is his Prophet, that you perform the, the daily prayer, that you give the zakat, that you fast the month of Ramadan. So Islam is a set of actions. It is not something that you believe in. It is a set of actions that you do. It defines a particular relationship between you and your Creator. It is, it, and, and this is why uh, the Quran and our theology speaks of all the prophets as being Muslims, meaning that they were submitted to God. And what is required of us is to, to live a life of submission to the Creator. And from the very beginning on the issue of the Islamic State, I convened uh, seven years ago uh, a group of scholars from different countries, from Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bahrain, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, <coughs> Iran, Sunni, Shia, a group of scholars, to, to, to define the term Islamic State from the point of view of our Jewish students and law. Because I felt this was something, there was a lot of confusion about. And the problem is that Muslims have a lot of emotion about an issue without having adequate understanding. So you feel very passionate and emotional about an issue they don't understand very well, you're likely to make wrong moves and wrong actions and wrong decisions. And we define an Islamic State not because we believe that the word Islamic State really has substantive meaning, but in terms of what our collective jurisprudence talked about. And one of, the, one of our professors who unfortunately passed away, Professor uh, Mahmoud Ghazi, who was the um, Thaqi, a great scholar of Islamic law from Pakistan. He was the rector of the Islamic University, uh, International University in Islamabad. He was also, for uh, some time, the, uh, the minister of al qaf in Pakistan, a member of the National Security Council, very, very, very accomplished man. He pointed out and reminded us that from the very beginning, Muslim communities existed as a minority, starting with the community that the Prophet sent to Abyssinia. Muslims lived, they lived, they were loyal to the country, loyal to the state, and they were not asked to establish an Islamic state, they were not asked to overthrow the regime of the, uh, you know, of the, of the Abyssinian king. They were, they were uh, commanded to live according to the ethics of Islam. But so we have the, and there were also Indian communities as minorities, uh, Muslim communities in India and other countries who, who lived from that time until today as, as minorities in non-Muslim majority countries. So we have a history, we have a jurisprudence, we have a body of Islamic law that deals with how Muslim minorities are to live in non-Muslim majority countries, as well as the obligations of Muslims when they have political power towards non-Muslim non -Muslim, uh, communities in their midst. And from the very beginning, when Muslims began to conquer other countries, the attitude we have again, uh, important precedents established by Muslim rulers, such as, uh, you know, uh, Abu Bakr, this first caliph, Omar, the second caliph, at whose time the empire really expanded and how they treated and protected the rights of non-Muslim communities. But in the last century, and particularly in the last uh, 40 years roughly, a kind of a, um, many more, starting with Pakistan and the, the notion of Islamic statehood, there has been a, uh, a kind of Islamic nationalism which has introduced ideas into our community which are alien to our fundamental tradition. Among them is that uh, an Islamic state is defined primarily and fundamentally by the application of the Hulud punishments. 
That's about as coherent as saying, if you want to have a US style democracy, punish criminals the way Americans punish criminals, and automatically an American style state will, you know, will, will come through. But we have had countries like Sudan, Afghanistan, even to some extent, you know, Pakistan, when under the rule of uh, President Zia al Haq, when he tried to establish Sharia law, that they really started with the application of the penal code. But if you examine our history from the time of Sayyidina Omar, in fact, he even suspended the penal code for theft at the time of famine, because he says it is the obligation of the state to, to support people. You cannot, I mean, there are fundamental human needs that Islamic law asserts the right to life, the right to free practice of your religion, the right to have a family, the right to own property, the right to live a life of dignity the life of pursuing your intellectual pursuits. These are the maqasid of the Sharia, the objectives of the Sharia. And you cannot penalize somebody before you, you fulfill their basic fundamental human needs. You can't have a famine and people starving and, 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 and punish them for stealing a loaf of bread. You can punish somebody who, who steals uh, you know, a truckload of, of UN aid in Somalia which is meant for the for the for the head. that is different because that is not the only, you know that is violating the intention of the law. So we have this wonderful understanding of Islamic law as part of our heritage, and it's important for us as Muslims to understand it because then we're able to apply our faith uh, with, with with the right understanding, which is an understanding based upon compassion. The Prophet is described in the Quran as someone who was not sent for any other purpose but compassion. We have not sent you except as a mercy to, to, to the world. And, and those of us who are Muslims, more so those of us who are Muslim professionals, uh, more so those of you who at your level of, of, of achievement and accomplishment have to represent the very finest what it means to be a Muslim which is to be submitted to God, but also follow the sunnah of the Prophet. If the Prophet was not sent except to be a rahmat al then we must define ourselves primarily and fundamentally by also being compassionate to, 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 to the world. And this is the reason why Islam expanded, not because it forced people, not because it coerced people, but we have had a, a, a history and a law and a tradition and a prescriptive set of all examples, starting with the Prophet, followed by his successors, that exhibited this kind of understanding, which is why Islam is a religion that actually can deal with, because we have no multicultural. Until a century ago, under Ottoman rules, the Ottomans ruled over Arabs, over Greeks, over Persians, over Turks, over Azeris, over all kinds of varieties of people over Muslims, who were of different methods, over, over Christians, of a variety of different uh, Christian uh, traditions, over Jews. This is our history. So were the Mughals in India, they ruled over Hindus, they ruled over the Sikhs, they ruled over Jains, all, all varieties of people. This is part of our intellectual tradition and jurisprudential tradition. But unfortunately, sometime in the last century, there's been a disconnect with that history. We have forgotten, as one of our scholars from Turkey in this group said, there's a collective amnesia that the unfortunate Muslim community has been gripped with. And we don't, re we don't really remember. And part of what we need is to remember our tradition and to practice the principles of our tradition. It is my hope and prayer that you will be among those ambassadors of compassion and mercy and ambassadors of that, that tradition that is something that you will find very attractive and very appealing. I thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'll end my direct remarks here. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. So. Um, we'll take um, a question from each one of you. If you could just state your your name, and if you, if you wish, um, where you come from, 
Uh, it's up to you. And um, I'll, I'll come around with the microphone. Four microphones out there.
the uh, Rajaratnam School of National Studies, Dr. Rohan, is from Sri Lanka. And he was brought here because of his experience with Tamil Tigers. Uh, so the, the, the ability to, to develop this, uh, this expertise and experience of people who have, who have been working with various spaces to then recreate initiatives. You need a group that has all the skill sets to address the, the, the issue in Southern Thailand, the issue in the Southern Philippines, the issue in Myanmar. But you need a different group of people who understand that history, who can be, um, who can marshal the arguments and also provide the, the, uh, the necessary means to, uh, to, to, to solve the problem. And in the case of the, the rehabilitation of the Jamaas Tamir people, they involve recognizing, bringing their families, uh, integrating them back into society. Uh, because when a conflagration has occurred, the healing process takes a lot of time. And you also have to, 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 to understand what your sense of community is based on. So if a person is engaged in terrorist activities or militant activities, uh, you know, you have to integrate him or her into society. It may require uh, family, require professional help, require financial help. Uh, so the, the, the process is quite uh, complex. Based on pocket science, it's understanding the various, and there are all the psychologists involved who understand the psychology of such people and how we can uh, bring them back and, and, and heal them. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind that the, um, that the need is there. And there's no doubt in my mind that the skill sets are available. Uh, it's, it's putting together the political will uh, to make these changes happen. I don't know the story of the rehabilitation of Tamil Tigers, for example, in Sri Lanka. Uh, but I, I'm sure that there is some overlap uh, in, in how you address these sorts of conflict and bring these people into this Society to become stakeholders in society rather than being marginalized and wanting to you know, throw stones into a glass house. Okay, can we have the next question? Okay, the gentleman. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pasha Martin. Uh, I'm from, originally from Bangladesh. Uh, I want to thank you for the great uh, talk. I really liked it. Uh, but if I may, I would like to go back to the previous question, which I didn't think you responded to, which was when uh, Muslims find themselves as uh, minorities and find themselves as uh, victims of injustice, uh, how should they respond? I would like to also extend that question a little bit, which is as uh, Muslims from other countries, how should we respond to the injustice of fellow Muslims in other parts of the world? That last point again, how should we respond to? Uh, let's say I'm in Singapore and I see what is happening in Myanmar and I'm upset, so how should I respond? Um, well, we should certainly respond to it. It is understandable that we do not feel good when there is conflict anywhere. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's like you can respond in a way that can aggravate the problem. Uh, and you know, respond in a way that helps the problem. I mean, it's like when somebody is falling down and hurt himself in an accident, you're not a doctor, in fact, the problem may make this problem even worse. Uh, I think to some extent, uh, there's an element of, of, of that. Uh, that is why I believe that the wiser way to go would be to have to perhaps lobby, if we can, with our governments, if we be, uh, to, to put together, to marshal the right resources so that we can actually address these issues. Uh, we have many agencies that are working on problems. With the United Nations, we have, uh, um, and uh, I mean, I've been heartened to see that, let's say, for the conference in Thailand, uh, the Thai government has been working with the Malaysian government to try to get them to, to help broker uh, a, uh, a peace solution to the problem of the Thais in Southern Thailand, of predominantly Muslims, predominantly <coughs> Malay in their ethnicity, more, much more Malay than they are Thais in terms of the, their, their, their uh, ethnicity even. Um, the, the conflicts that exist in the Muslim world are so diverse. 
I mean, like, what do we do for the situation in Syria? Syria is a, is a major problem. What do we do for the situation in Egypt? And I, I'm pain that I've been reading in the National Herald Tribune the last, you know, two days or three days ago. There were two consecutive front page articles in my opinion on Egypt. Uh, first one about women being born, more cases of women being raped in, in, in Tahrir Square by group get by groups of youths coming in India. Um, and we have more and more cases of, uh, and, and then I think yesterday before, day before, uh, a front page article on the on, on how the economy of Egypt is going twisting towards the brink. Prices of diesel is going up, and which means prices of all commodities are going up. People are having a hard time affording bread. Uh, I mean, the, the, the challenges which exist in the Muslim world are so big. I have a friend of mine in Pakistan who is worried that Pakistan is a failed state with nuclear capacity. Uh, the problems that we have in the Muslim world are not just a matter of Muslim minorities in Myanmar. Uh, and I don't think we as Muslims have really stepped up to the plate. In fact, the OIC had been an uh, initiative that was established to address the needs of the Muslim community globally. Many people have felt that the OIC has not really done enough to address the problems of conflicts uh, in, in the Muslim world. Um, and these conflicts, to my mind, are primarily about issues that really do not relate to Islam. The conflicts have to do with, with, with power issues, with economic issues. Um, you say you're from Bangladesh. There's conflict right now in Bangladesh happening, which, which I don't know what the solution is to. Uh, but when, when you have these problems, and these are problems that I am not qualified to solve, if I could wave a magic wand and, and solve them, it would be fantastic. But I believe the experience, this is why I said the experience of what happened was not about Singapore. Singapore is a kind of a microcosm. It's like a, it's like a, a laboratory. You're small enough that you can perform things here, like you perform experiments in the lab, then you try to scale them up. So to the extent that something that is some successes in Singapore, what we need to do is to look at why it was successful, what were the elements that made it successful, and how do we scale it up to, to solve the problems in the young world. Be in, uh, in in other countries. So I did not answer the question directly in terms of a specific prescription for what can be done in Myanmar. But what, how I answered it was in terms of the formula. So if you look at what was done in Singapore to address the Muslim issue, look at what has happened in Sri Lanka to solve the Tamil Tiger uh, situation, and then by studying it, and uh, you can develop a, a, an algorithm or a formula that you then can try to apply in other contexts. When I was sat at the after two-day conference, we had, a, we had a breakfast meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, who was, who was also the Minister of Home Affairs. And the particular agenda of that discussion was this very issue. I said, how can we, what we have learned here, how can we take what we have learned here and apply it in other locations? They knew very well that what, can, what was done successfully cannot just be duplicated cookie cutter style. It has to be taken and, and re, recrafted in the cultural setting, the societal setting, the religious setting of that particular society. Knowing those, that society, knowing those problems, you know, just cannot take it and duplicate it straight. You need, you need, to, you need to translate it like you translate from one language to another. You can translate from one, one national context to another national context. But there are some lessons which were learned. And it's clear to me, it cannot just be a religious initiative. It, it has to be religious, it has to be political, it has to have the ability to provide the societal reintegration, it, and it has to be able to, to also include the, the uh, the, uh, the economic uh, incentives, the value uh, and, and, and the requisite supports. So this is what I call the formula, the algorithm, or the ingredients that have to be uh, cooked together in the Myanmar context, in the 
Bangladeshi context, in the southern town context. Uh, and to the extent that you can lobby your government or can participate to help create those initiatives, then that would be wonderful. So I know some of you raised your hands over there, but I just want to ask you, does that answer your question? Because I, I thought your second question was about how Muslims feel, like yourselves, about the injustice done to Muslim countries by non-Muslim countries. Is that also what you meant? Uh, what I really liked about your talk before was the issue of Islam. Fundamentally, it's about the real life. It's not about identity. So you are actually reminding me to look at in at the individual as the unit of analysis. But what I find is the problem of changing this aggregation. When you bring the individual's responsibility and you aggregate as a responsibility of the community, that's where it is not clear to me exactly how to do what and the conflicts that can arise from that kind of mismatch. So to some extent I I I, I how could I say I don't really think that you have answered my question, but I don't think that it is easily answered either. Like I said, I don't have to answer You know, we need to think of ourselves in terms of the many, many problems that we have within our communities. Uh, I mean, we are pain on many, many different levels. I'm pain as a Muslim, I'm pain as an Arab, I'm pain as, as an Egyptian, I'm pain as a global citizen over many, many issues that exist in, in, in the world today. Uh, and we all have to play our role in making it happen, but there's a limit to what we can do. And, and, and to the extent that we can, that we can partner with, with players that have the ability to make something happen, then, then I think that's the way that can probably be solved. Thank you. We'll move on now. Um, thanks for that question. Um, anyone else? I might just, okay, the gentleman up here. Uh, my name is Umar. I have been living in Singapore for the last 10 years. I came here in 2003, originally from Pakistan. Um, it's interesting the insights that you've shared, and you know you've mentioned Pakistan and Afghanistan in the last uh, in, in, in in your uh, lecture as well as in the discourse. My question to you is: um, I, as a Pakistani, have realized you know things were how things have changed over the last 20 years. When I was growing up, my father used to travel to the states to most of the Western world without any problems. His visa would be processed if he had to go to the United States within three days, four days. Pakistan used to be a country where there's a lot of economic growth and you could see that uh, with the ease that people would get visas to travel overseas from Pakistan. Um, when I look at myself now, if I had to apply for a US visa, which I did recently, they made me wait for two months and I had to go through a special list of checks and I think that's standard procedure nowadays. So. What I want to understand is, what can be done to minimize the deficit between the Western world and the Muslim world? And you, as a Muslim who's lived in the United States, um, born in Kuwait, and with the Egyptian heritage, how do you perceive that Muslim countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, as well, they has a sizable Muslim population. How can this be changed? If you go to the United States Embassy's website, you will see that 25 lists, there's a list of countries, uh, 25 countries in there, which have to go through a special procedure to apply for a visa. So my question is, is sort of you know covering a whole lot of, uh, it, it's, it's not a simple issue, it's not just immigration. Um, basically what it is highlighting is a lack of trust between America and the Western world and the Muslim world. How can that be changed? And what do you think can Muslim countries do in general, um, both on a governmental level as well as on a non-profit uh, you know, community level? What can be done? Thank you. That's a huge question. Um, I've dedicated my life after 9 to improving U.S. Muslim relations. Uh, and it's an ongoing, it's a huge task, a huge job. Uh, because um, because uh, with 9-11, 9-11, the perception of America was seen as an act 
done upon it by Islam. And, and part of the reason has had to do with the fact that we have created uh, political liberation movements that use the vocabulary of Islam. And one of the questions that was asked me by a journalist after 9 11 he says, We understand political liberation movements, we understand political, uh, popular conflict in the region of Palestine. But what we don't understand is why is it from Morocco to India to, to, to the Philippines you see Muslim uh, groups, Muslim political parties, Jamaat Islamiya, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Muslim Hamas, uh, you know, Islamic brigades, wherever you go, that Lashq al Taiba, Lashq Muhammad, I think, in Pakistan, all of who use the very language of the of Islam. And, and, and therefore, in the Western perception, Islam itself has become part of a vocabulary that seems to command militancy. And if you look at the increased number of websites which exist today, which call upon jihad, and jihad, you have to perform jihad, and so forth. So this language of, uh, of militancy has become more, more, uh, uh, more strident uh, and has, uh, has created this environment uh, of fear. And uh, suddenly, uh, this is part of what has happened in America, and we're doing what we can to combat it. But in the American context, uh, I have, uh, I have been, been making the case that we as Muslims in America need to define ourselves and to position ourselves as American Muslims. And, and, uh, and I speak about that, I write about that in my book, because that is part of what will, re what will make Americans see Islam as an American religion. Because right now Americans see Islam as a foreign religion. Um, and, and I argue this on the basis of our own heritage. When Islam first spread from the Hejaz to all the countries, it was an alien religion. But it expressed itself in the Egyptian culture, in the Arabi culture, in the Persian culture, in the South Asian culture, um, in the Indonesian culture, in Malay culture. Um, you know, when I was a boy growing up in Malaysia, when a Chinese and a non-Muslim became a Muslim, they would say he became Malay, Maso Malay. They didn't say Maso Islam. They say he, he became, he ended Malayness. Now, this did not happen overnight. The Malays were originally Hindus. Now, what, how did this transfer take place? 70 years ago, there's no Pakistan. But Pakistanis think of Islam as a Pakistani religion. They don't think of it as an Arab religion. The Egyptians think of Islam as a Turkish religion. I'm sorry, the Turks think of Islam as a Turkish religion. The Iranians think of Islam as an Iranian religion. They don't think of it as an Arab religion. And there's a tension between the Arabs and the Iranians at the moment. And yet they're both Muslims. So we need to, we need to establish uh, uh, you know, Islam in America as an, as an American religion. And this is part of our heritage and it's part of the work that we need to do. And when that happens, of course, what happened in a year ago, Five years. It takes a generation of two or three, typically, but it will happen, and we have to express our Islam in the laws of the land, in the institutions of the land, in the, in the dress code of the land. You know, I mean, Muslim dress in India or South Asia is very different than Muslim dress in Indonesia or in Saudi Arabia and so forth. So that is part. That is one aspect of the huge work in in in. Establishing that trust. Secondly, more and more Muslims participating at higher levels of government in America. Uh, we have increasing numbers of Muslims now who are legislative aides, members of Congress and senators. So as, as, as Muslims become part of the fabric of society, of the political process, of the discussion, that will be, be increase the trust and comfort level <coughs> of people with Muslims. Also, we are redefining the discourse on, on, on militancy. I had the occasion to, to share with the Prime Minister of Malaysia my own experience at the breakfast meeting three years ago, where I said, you know, I, I believe that the real battlefront is not between Islam and the West, or, you know, Muslims and Jews, or Muslims and Hindus. The real battlefront is between the extremists of all traditions against the moderates of all traditions, because the extremists have the same mindset. Look at the Sri Lankan Tigers, Jamaa Islamia, look at all the extremists, be they Muslim or Christians or Hindus, they actually operate with the same mindset. 
and they feed, they feed, they feed each other. So we moderates have to get together strategically and tactically to attenuate the voices of the extremists in all our midst. Whereas it's the Jewish extremists who fuel the Palestinian extremists. And it's a tit for tat and it grows. So we who are moderate, and moderate in the sense of perfection, in the sense of learning what it means, uh, have to articulate uh, a philosophy of coexistence, of moderation, uh, and, and prosecute the case. And we have prosecuted in the media, in our religion, in policies. Uh, but it, it's, it's a process that takes so many time. Thank you, my friend. If, if you guys don't mind, I just want to have a follow-up question to what he mentioned about the Tamil Tigers before. It's true that the Tamil Tigers are, are, have integrated into the Sri Lankan society and Sri Lanka is a lot more peaceful. There's a tourism boom in Sri Lanka, which is quite sudden, and it's, there's a lot of tourists even from Singapore going to Sri Lanka. But the reason why I want to follow up with this question is, isn't it true that the Tamil Tigers were obliterated with massive force before they were allowed to integrate into society? So if you use that same analogy, is that what we're saying? Is that the approach we should take towards all other extremist groups? And if not, how can we actually get them to integrate? Again, I, I don't have the complete detailed answer. Uh, I have the formula. The formula is that it does require the, the function of the law enforcement agencies because security and national security is a major issue to, to any country. I mean, no country. I mean, when, when, um, when the extremists began to bomb even in Saudi Arabia, and, things, and, and target Saudi installations. The Saudi government responded, you know, very, very rapidly with its all its law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, to, to, to prevent these things from happening. Because no no government, no government can survive if it does not address the issue of national security. It's number one. The number one obligation of any government is to secure the security of, of its citizens. Um, but uh, having, uh, so, and, and the, issue, the, the problem of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, militancy expressed in the name of religion is nothing new in our faith. It happened originally with the Khawarij. Sayyidina Ali had a group of followers who rebelled against him and developed a philosophy actually based upon their concept of what the Khalifa should be like. And he wanted to have to fight them. And he had to fight them over a number of years, and one of them actually assassinated him. And so there is a precedence, even in our own Islamic history, where a group of militants who were so convinced of democracy had to be radically eliminated. Um, but I'm not saying that, that elimination, to, to eliminate a, 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 an extremist mentality, requires this combination of both uh, combating them in the, in the uh, in the law enforcement part, but also the changing of hearts and minds part. And one of the most effective means has been to get ex-terrorists who were then convinced of their, of their wrong deeds, who were the most um, eloquent uh, uh, spokesmen or spokespeople on combat, on, on changing other terrorists' minds, hearts and minds, and converting them to, to and helping them to properly the integration process. Uh, again, I don't think this is the, the, the venue to discuss in great detail because, again, it's not my expertise. I can speak from the religious point of view. I can't speak the law enforcement aspect. I can't speak the political aspect. But there's no doubt that it will not succeed unless you have all of these components involved in your, in your, in your team or in the skill set that you bring to the table to address this issue. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay, can we have the next question? I mean, you won't get many opportunities like this with, with small groups to, to directly ask your questions to Imam Faisal. He only comes once in, in every few years. So. Okay, the gentleman in black. Assalamu alaikum. I, I actually intend, didn't intend to have a question, but uh, seeing that I have 
a group of three or four nice expats talking, I think I have to represent the Singapore flag. So uh, here's my question. My name is Ibrahim and I'm a former student of this school. Um, I think in today's world, we realize that we are moving, moving towards a, a very strong, how do I say, Western ideals in the sense that a good society is a democratic society. A good society is one that has a circular uh, environment, one where God is detached from all our affairs. And if you notice, um, countries, like, countries in the West who have excelled tend to be circular states. In fact, in Singapore also we are a big circular state. And if you look at the Muslim countries, unfortunately, we are all not doing very well. So, what is our position as a Muslim? If you are saying that, if uh, the leading intellectuals uh, who mainly dominate in the West are saying that, the best way forward is to have uh, a, a circular, a circular state, a circular, a circular economy. If there is a word, because when you attach God to all affairs, complications come. But as a Muslim, it is also very complicated for us because we cannot do that. And how do you reconcile this? Then? Excellent question. Thank you. I I believe that there is a difference between being a state in the sense of the nature of government and a state in the sense of the nature of a society. Uh, in America, we have a very clear concept of a separation of church and state. The state will not get involved in those affairs. It will, not, it will not deploy the coercive powers of the state to, to, to push one religion or one method or one interpretation of any religion against any other. And I believe that, that that principle, that when the coercive powers of the state may not be used to push one religion or one interpretation, is in fact quite consistent with what I believe to be the, the, the tradition of Islamic, proper Islamic rule by Muslims. In fact, this was part of the problem in the first few centuries of Islam until there was a great tension between the courts and the other Muslim scholars until a truce <coughs> negotiated between the two of them, Muhammad and Hanbal, which made him very popular uh, with the Khayyib Caliph at that time. So, kind of a de facto separation of church and state existed in the Muslim world, which resulted in actually, I think, more prosperity. Um, and yet, in America, 90%, I think, both the Americans, 90% of Americans believe in God. Americans, in spite of in, in, we are not, I don't know what I mean by secular. Um, the American Constitution, the American Pledge of Independence actually promotes the idea of God. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and property. And property was changed in pursuit of happiness. Now, the notion that these rights are inalienable, I think, was by the Creator. And then the, the Declaration continues to speak about the laws of nature and of nature's God. So the American social contract is a very God-conscious God contract. Uh, the, the, and it promotes God. I mean, the, the, the Congress begins by a prayer every opening of Congress. Uh, and uh, it had different people, different religions actually, reciting a prayer. It's the Supreme Court begins its sessions by a prayer, by invoking God. Uh, the, the President of the United States, whenever he gives the, uh, a speech to the American people, it always ends and, you know, may God bless America. Yeah, I mean, this is so, uh, America is a very God-conscious nation in terms of its societal contract. But it, does, but it does not enforce any one religion, but it protects and, and, and encourages the practice of religion. And I think that is the right role of a government. So it should be distinct between a state in terms of what the powers of the government should be is a big religion, and the, the promotion of religion in society, and the protection of religion in society. I think this is what a proper Islamic rule is all about. Now, if by a state you mean a society, a community, I encourage people to be godly. And, and the, the ethics of religion, in terms of the golden rule, in terms of treating people the way you want to be treated, in terms of being kind and charitable to people, 
in terms of taking care of the poor. I mean, what does the Quran say? You have no problem so that uh, al -ma'un. Have you seen the one who, who gives the lie to religion? And what is the next couple of verses? And then it can be an audience. It's the one who rejects the orphans, doesn't help orphans. Well, I put to Allah for I'm does not does not promote the feeling of the poor. So the Quran itself identifies religion, okay, as being primarily taking care of the, the underprivileged. So a society that takes care of the poor, that helps eradicate poverty, as poverty alleviation, poverty eradication policies, is in my opinion a more Islamic country. Because the, the verse goes on, and then Allah says, Why do the Muslims? Woe to those who perform their salah. Very, I mean, this is very peculiar language. <coughs> the almost salah is very important to us as Muslims. Prayer. Then God says, woe to those who perform their prayers. Who are unmindful of their prayers. Who are down and down and who prevent or who not really help. So, to, so a godly society is a society that helps itself. That, 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 that tries to eliminate the poor, takes care of orphans. All right? And we see this happening in Western societies. That they are successful not because they call themselves secular. To me, an Islamic society, we, we, that's what I'm saying, we fall in love with the word Islam. But in practice, we are corrupt. In practice, we have massive poverty. In practice, we, are, we, 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 we do not try to, to help every member of the community. Um, so we may be Muslim in name, but we're not Muslim in practice. And this this surah actually talks about this. It says, you know, don't you know, if you are um, religious, it is about building a community that takes care of itself, that helps the poor, because otherwise your religion is meaningless. Um, and, and that's what godliness is about. We believe in God, then our religion becomes meaningful. And that's part of what we discovered in the definition of what an Islamic state is, not in terms of nomenclature, but in terms of real substance, in terms of helping the people. I don't care if Pakistan is an Islamic state officially, but it is not going to be a godly state. I mean, don't think of, we, we forget the word, I wish we could just eliminate the word Islam. <coughs> As I found out yesterday, that God in the Quran never once addresses the followers of Muhammad as Muslims. Never once to say, Ya Alladina Aslam, always Ya Alladina Amin, believers. We have to be a believing state. We have, to, we have to encourage belief in God. We have to, believe, we have to encourage Iman and Ihsan and ethics, value, virtue, the virtuous state. Okay. That's what God wants. If you are a God conscious state, then you are a virtuous state. If you are a virtuous person, that's what's important. And you see virtue in other people. Many, Amer many Muslims who have immigrated to America say, you know what? America is more of an Islamic state than my home country of Egypt or Pakistan, whatever. I'm more respected here. A Pakistani doctor friend of mine says, I'm a confident of is a partner in a group of doctors. He says, my, my partners are not Muslims, but they treat me with respect, they are honest, they don't cheat. I go to Pakistan, my home country, and I'm cheated out of this, I'm cheated out of that. And he says, you know, and why do we call ourselves an Islamic state? So it is your behavior and your ethics which defines your judgment and, and of, of what you mean as being an Islamic state, and actually becoming even more pious. And many of us who have immigrated to America become more genuinely religious in America than we were in our own countries. Because our religion is part of an act of choice. You know? Now, as a, in a Muslim in Bangladesh, ah, everybody's Muslim. You know, you're Muslim because it's a social pressure. But when you're in America, there's <coughs> because you actually believe in prayer. You actually want to fast. 
So our, there's a greater there's a greater sweetness of faith because you are doing it out of a personal sense of conviction. Because if you don't need to you don't need to practice your Islam if you're in America, if you don't want to. Um, and that's I think one of the nice things about being a minority as a Muslim. You practice your faith because you want to, not because you have to. Uh, but that's the kind of society we have to build. And 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 I'm, I'm delighted because as expatriates, you are not part of any one society, you're part of multiple societies. You, know? you have multiple nationalities. When you, you have dual passports or triple passports. Um, so we do need to develop a global consciousness today that is, that is, God, that is a God consciousness. This is why spirituality is more important. This is why ethics is important. And the Prophet said, in the Muhammad, religion is is, is, is how you treat others. And to me, that's what it's all about. Not about being you know, secular. These are names. I didn't even know what the title of this speak to be there. We, don't, we, we, we throw about words, but we don't even know what they mean. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe we can squeeze one, maybe one and a half more questions. <laughs> okay, if not, I'm going to probably halt the session and ask him a question. Sorry, did you have a question? No? Oh, okay. The lady over there with the uh, multicolored um, scarf. Okay, black and purple, sorry. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm a Singaporean and part of Yang Yang Pi. Just to sort of build on the previous question about building Islamic society, or rather, a believing society. Um, how do you reverse, is there a possibility of reversing this, seeing Islam as a noun and back to being a verb? Because frankly speaking, I'm quite pessimistic that that's ever going to happen. Um, I think the fact that, you, that Muslims are more comfortable seeing something in front of them or having Islam as a visible thing that they can grasp, whether it be in, in dress or banking or form, basically. Uh, it just seems to be the overriding wave, and this Islamization, wave of Islamization seems to be the trend that's still going on. And despite all this talk, all the efforts to you know really engage and talk about being more of the it just doesn't seem to be coming through. And I think, particularly, I mean, just speaking as a Singaporean, I don't see that really happening in our society, despite being a you know, Muslim minority where you think that because we're a minority, we have the, the, the uh, freedom to practice how we do, the some should be. But um, yeah, that's my two cents. Well, I, I, it, it does sound like a rather lost proposition, lost cause. But I believe that if enough of us speak about it, if enough of us speak loudly about it, if enough of us critical mass of people will speak about it, it eventually will become a movement. And that is why I, mean, I, I, I discussed with the Prime Minister of Malaysia this idea that we need to develop a global coalition of moderates and put it in a movement. Because when we have a movement, we actually become a movement. Of course, it is now with the elections. But it's my hope that after that, we'll actually, re we'll actually create the basis of, of a moderate movement of moderates, of all the great conditions that identify, I mean, that the concepts of moderation exist not only in, in, in Islam and the Quran, exist in Buddhism, exist in Taoism, exist in Christianity, exist in Greek philosophy. So um, the, the tools are there. Plus also, I've seen swings. When you study history, you see swings in history. You know, until, I mean, when I grew up, uh, there was a fear of communism. Communism was simply growing. Socialism was simply growing. Uh, I know it's not like it's about the socialist republic, but um, after 1989, uh, you know, socialism began to be removed. I mean, all the, the notions and constructs of a communistic or socialist society, um, they, they said, you know what, we need to bring capitalism. We need to bring capitalism into money markets, we need to bring banks, Western style banks, to, to develop our society. So we, we, we do see swings in, in, in history. Uh, and I believe that um, um, it's, uh, 
9-11 was a, was a kind of a watershed moment that, because we have seen, I've seen in my life, the rise of Islamic extremism, Islamist fundamentalism, kind of, a, and it's become even militant now. And, and, I, and I think that with 9-11 it reached its, its crescendo. But uh, Muslim countries now become the victims of Islamic militancy. So I, I think there is, a, there is now a, a beginning of a, of a reaction and if we can marshal the resources and we can, uh, we can multiply these voices, to bring these arguments to bear, uh, I believe this is, uh, we can succeed in that, number one. I also believe the world needs it. You know, Allah says in the Quran, there's a more than one passage, he talks about the different prophets who came, you know, and Moses, and Jesus, and Muhammad. Then God says, and this community of yours is one ummah, is one nation, and I am your Lord, your one who so worship you. What I believe the world needs today, it needs a, a new global consciousness. And you are representative of this. I mean, when I grew up, there were not that many people who are multicultural. But more and more people now are multicultural. The, the, the direction of the future is multicultural. Europe, Europe is undergoing a fundamental shift from being a monocultural society to being a multicultural society. The United States is a model of a multicultural society. Singapore is finding its way towards being a multi, not encouraging immigrants. So it, it, it's, it's positioning itself to be a multicultural society. Malaysia is a multicultural society since its foundation. Um, more and more countries are becoming multicultural. The Emirates are becoming multicultural. So multicultural societies is the way of the future. Um, and we need to develop the means to, 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 to build multicultural societies, multicultural societies. And the notion of being one nation under God, the American concept, is actually a very Islamic concept as well. Um, so I believe that that the, the, the vectors are pointing to that. Uh, and and uh, part of your role as Muslim professionals, you are among the highest uh, in any society. You are representative of the highest percentile of any society in terms of accomplishments, in terms of income, in terms of networking, in terms of the ability to to, um, uh, to broadcast ideas, to plant them, to make them happen. And this is why I'm speaking before you today. But I believe the world needs them, like this notion of a global consciousness. And the efforts seen from political uh, initiatives such as the United Nations, when the United Nations was formed, the League of Nations before that was formed, it was towards, the, towards this kind of an objective. We don't have yet universal government. I don't think we will. We will. But look at what Europe is going through. The European Union, the European Common Market. There is a, there is a need for us today to, 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 to sketch the contours of what a globalized society will be. We have now globalized economy. Our, our economy is now a globalized economy. Governments can't control the globalization of the economy today. Um, we, we have a need for a globalized currency today. Okay, these are, people are thinking about how to develop a globalized currency. But there's a, there is a need for that. There's also a need for a globalized philosophy that will unite us as humans. And I believe the answer to that is in a God consciousness. Because whether you are Buddhist, whether you are Hindu, whether you are Christian, whether you are a Muslim, there is a fundamental set of common denominators. And our faith, if you look at our faith, not from through the lens of what I call an Islamic nationalistic point of view, but if you look at Islam from the Quranic point of view, if you look from the point of view of a believer, if you, if you define all of the prophets as being Muslims, and therefore their followers as being Muslims, as fellow believers, 
can just think of Christians and Jews, but you think of followers of this man or that man. That's what it really is.